Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Everybody hear me okay in the back? As a speaker, I don't have an indoor voice, so I don't actually know how loud I am or am not speaking, but I always find it amusing when someone like me says, can you hear me in the back? Because of course, if you can't hear me, you can't answer that question anyway, so I guess it's fine. I'm a little confused because it's October and it's not cloudy and rainy and I can actually wear shorts today. I mean, I threw shorts in my bag packing for this trip on a lark thinking, well, there's no way I'll need shorts. And I looked at the weather today. I'm like, it's going to be what, 23, 24. I'm okay with it. I'm not complaining in any way, shape or form, but I figured that's at least part of why I needed to wear something very bright and very spring-like today. Since I think we've inverted hemispheres or something and you know, I'm sure it'll all work itself out. <laughs> I, I should even mention this, but I was checking the weather back home, and in the far northern part of my home state of Minnesota, there will actually be plowable snow. Now, that's pretty rare for this time of year. That's awfully darn early for us to even get, like, flurries, but I'm very glad I don't live in far northern Minnesota, otherwise known as southern Canada. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about site reliability engineering. I am Nate Shuda. I am an architect and advocate at Pivotal. Somebody actually accused me of being an architect as a service which I thought was actually kind of a cool thing until I sounded out the acronym and then I went, oh, wait a minute, that might not be quite as complimentary as I thought it was. So I do feel like I should mention, I wrote a little, well, my wife calls it a pamphlet. It's a little ebook that I put together earlier this year to kind of go through a lot of the stuff that I think about in my job and what I'm doing as, as I go around and talk to people about architecture. But we'll talk about, about site reliability engineering here today. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with the fact that in our line of work, the software development practices that we use today are not the same ones that you used probably at the beginning of your career. They evolve. Now, that's a good thing. This is a feature, not a bug. I would be surprised if we continued to do things the way we used to in the past. I was talking to a manager of mine, this is a long time ago, and he was saying when he was in the beginning of his career, he walked by someone's cube and they were going through a set of cards. I mean, literally just flipping through the cards. Now, most of us probably don't remember when punch cards were a thing, but that was actually how we used to program back in the day. And my, my manager asked him, hey, what are you doing? And without missing a beat, he said, I'm debugging. I mean, so imagine if that's how we had to work today, having to go through stacks and stacks of cards to figure out what was going on. Now, I don't think this is surprising because this is really part of what we mean by agile, by little a agile. And what's fascinating to me in my career is to see how we've gone from this, this huge separation between what developers were doing and what operation teams were doing to the point now where almost everybody has some kind of a DevOps function or a DevOps group or people who are DevOps engineers. And of course, not surprisingly, our applications have evolved as well. And so instead of writing these ginormous monoliths, we started to go to this more service-oriented approach, which today has sort of morphed into microservices and functions and these really small things that do one thing and do it really well, but then we got to wire a whole bunch of stuff together, which has its own set of interesting problems as well, only to realize that, well, we've gotten rid of some of the worst parts of the monolith, but boy, we've got some other issues too. It's not all just puppies and rainbows, darn it. I kind of thought we finally had the golden hammer. I guess we'll just keep trying. Now, what you're starting to see today largely is a reaction to the fact that we're going from having one ginormous code base to dozens, hundreds, thousands of services. How do we manage all that? And at least part of what we're doing to figure that out is this concept of site reliability engineering. Now, what's interesting is I talk to some groups and you ask, well, how many microservices do you have? And they kind of shrug. They're like, we don't know. There's a lot of them. They just kind of keep appearing. And that's kind of a natural outcropping of some of the advantages that microservices give us. You know, so we need to understand that we can't take those same practices that we used 10 years ago to try to keep our production environments happy and healthy and think that's going to work in an environment that is radically different than what we used to do. So why are we starting to see this? What does this mean for us? And what sort of practices can we adopt? And, and more importantly, how can we all work together? You know, an awful lot of what I tend to do with clients boils down to what I call sort of like technical marriage counseling. It's just being able to ask impertinent questions. And very often what it boils down to is, oh, these two groups just aren't talking to one another. We need to get these two groups in a room, get them to hug it out, and then we can move forward. You know, it, it, as much as I think and, and used to think our industry is all about technology problems, so often what it boils down to is, hey, we just need to talk or we just need to deal with this cultural issue, or there's an incentive mismatch that we need to work through. 
You know, we like to think technology can solve all these problems. Sadly, it can't. So what do we mean by SRE? I think the first problem here, the first part of this is understanding our history. As an industry, we're terrible at this. We just don't do a very good job of, of focusing on where we came from, how we got here. Now, some of that's immaturity. We've only been around about a human generation, and so we're learning. There's no getting around it. We're getting better every day. Consider for a minute that people who work in the physical world, building buildings like the one we're in, as a species, we have been building buildings for millennia. This is not new. We still screw it up from time to time, which is kind of fascinating and sad. But we've worked with these materials for many, 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 many years. And then as, as humans trying to build software, we haven't been doing it very long, and we seem to reinvent our materials every six to 18 months. And then we wonder why we haven't mastered all this stuff yet. Now, I would argue that SRE is not so much a new concept as just a catchy name. And I will make the argument that this goes back to the Apollo program. So I would make the argument that the very first site reliability engineer was probably Margaret Hamilton. And so Margaret Hamilton worked on the software of the Apollo program. And depending on which variant of the story you read, she was in the lab while they were doing a simulation of a lunar landing. And they inadvertently crashed the simulation by running a pre-launch program. Now it turns out when you run that pre-launch program, it wipes out the navigation data. Now I know one of the most transformative things for me has been the fact that my phone knows how to get from point A to point B. I was thinking about this recently. When I was a kid, I was amazed that my dad always knew how to get places. And I remember being roughly the age my son is now and thinking, boy, I'm gonna start driving in a few years. How am I gonna memorize all these roads? How does my dad know how to get from point A to point B? We are gonna do a road trip and it was the night before and I saw him reach under his chair and pull out an atlas. And he started looking through the maps and I went, oh, that's how he knows how to get from point A to point B. He cheats, he looks at a map. Now I will admit a little bit of my sort of dad is omniscient kind of died that day because it's like he uses a book to help him figure out how to get to point A to point B. Now my son has no illusions of that because I just asked my phone how to get places. And the beauty of the phone is when you make a wrong turn, it says recalculating. Now that works with 2018 technology, not so much in the Apollo era pretty hard to recalculate your navigation data when you're a couple hundred thousand miles away from the Earth. Now, Hamilton, like any good engineer, said, you know what, this is a problem. We should put some error checking code in so that if one of the astronauts inadvertently presses this button while they're trying to navigate, it doesn't destroy that data, and that's probably the right thing to do. Well, surprisingly, or maybe not, depending on your view of bureaucracy, upper management at NASA said, that's crazy, that's foolish, you don't understand the astronauts are perfect. They are highly trained, highly intelligent individuals. We will just tell them not to press the button. And so of course they won't press the button. Well, what happened? They pressed the button. No one could have predicted this. And sure enough, it wiped out the navigation data. Now luckily for those astronauts, Margaret was able to update the documentation so that when this happened, NASA wasn't you know, going to a table, shaking out a bunch of stuff and saying, we've got to make this fit into that using nothing but this. And they said, oh, OK, no problem. We know what to do. We'll fix it. So they're able to recover the data. I'm fairly confident it would have been a very, very, now obviously it wasn't Apollo 13, but it would have been a very different movie if you know, these astronauts were, were still basically circling the moon as skeletons. Now, one of the mantras in SRE is hope is not a strategy. And yet this is what so many of our organizations employ. I hope this is going to work. I hope this runs in production. I hope this all works out for the best. That's not what we can afford today. There's just too much software in the world for that to be an appropriate approach. Now, the only nice thing I can say about hope is it's what rebellions are built on. So we've got that going for us. But if you've done this long enough, you realize that if there is a way for something to fail, it will fail. It will find those interesting edge cases. It's the nature of the beast. That's part of what makes our industry so challenging is we have to think about all those oddities that you don't normally deal with in everyday life. And one of my favorite ways to get people to think about this is to ask them to describe their morning routine. You know, so we all kind of have our different routine. You kind of got these habits you do, you know, you get up, you brush your teeth, you have breakfast, whatever. And what's always fascinating to me is to see the different levels of granularity people will use to describe their morning routine. Some people are very precise. And it's, I get up at 7.07 on the dot because 7.07 allows me to have exactly 13 minutes and then I can catch my bus or I can catch my train or whatever it happens to be. Other people are just very vague. Well, I wake up and I go to work. 
But what people don't appreciate is as human beings, we're very adaptable. So most of us eat breakfast in the morning. So what happens if you decide, I'm coming to have breakfast, you go downstairs and you're, you're out of toast, you're out of bread, you got no bread. Do you just like sit there and beach ball for like an hour until somebody comes and gives you bread? No, you just adapt. You're like, well, instead of, you know, bread, I'll have cereal. Instead of cereal, I'll have oatmeal, whatever. You just adapt. Software can't do that. And so part of the challenge for us is we need to think about these failure cases. We need to be malicious in how we look at our systems. And one of the challenges that we've traditionally faced is that our production ops people were, or our systems are typically run by a sysadmin, a prod ops, something like that. And that was okay in the earlier era of software where we had a small number of large systems. But when you look around our world today, everything is services. I mean, I'm convinced at this point I can literally put any letter in front of AAS and it's a thing. You know, we've got IaaS, we've got CAS, PaaS, SaaS, you know, functions as a service. I'm pretty sure you can do pizza as a service. I'm, I'm quite certain I can tweet and a pizza shows up. I have no idea how that works because I'm old, but I'm sure it's a thing. Right? I know I've certainly ordered pizza from an Uber before. That's kind of fascinating. And as I said before, I've been accused of being an architect as a service. Now, these aren't new things. Some of you, I'm sure, remember Corba. You might remember it fondly, you might not. But our industry has this tendency to sort of reinvent the same concept, reinvent the proverbial wheel, and then stamp a new name on it to make it something shiny and new. So if you go back to Corba, the goal of Corba was to facilitate communication for disparate systems on diverse platforms. That's a pretty good definition of microservices, if you ask me. And we can argue about the... <coughs> you know, the nuance, but, but that to me is a pretty darn good definition of what we mean by microservices. Now, maybe that's too soon for some of you, but I bet a few of you have done EJBs before. I've spent a fair amount of my career writing EJBs. That was not a lot of fun. I mean, personally, I've tried to wipe as much of that out of my memory banks as humanly possible. But of course, we just kept going. I mean, I very distinctly remember when SOA was the thing. And at a conference like this, there would have been a whole track on SOA and we have to do SOA, 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 which in retrospect was basically just take this ginormous 30,000 line method and, and put an endpoint on it so you can poke it with a web browser because that's close enough. Now, I mean, there were blogs, there were books, there were conferences, it was fantastic. Now, of course, a lot of us realized that wasn't the bee's knees. And so then we kind of morphed into this idea of API first. So we're gonna build the API and then we'll figure out who's gonna consume it. And that got very popular. In fact, one of the very first ones that I ran into was this one. And I remember thinking, Charmin is a paper goods company. Why the heck are they putting out an API? That seems very strange. Until you realize that the API is designed to help you find a bathroom. And if you've ever traveled, you know how helpful that can actually be. So it turns out these APIs are kind of interesting. Now, maybe you're like, well, that's, I don't like scatological humor. That's not my thing. I get it but I can pretty much guarantee everyone in this room at one point or another today has or will use this API. This is Dark Sky's weather API. I remember when Dark Sky first came out, it's sort of claim to fame was, we can tell you when it's going to rain. And I thought it was like voodoo because it would say, hey, rain's gonna start in 15 minutes, it'll end a half hour later. And then sure enough, about 15 minutes later, precipitation starts to fall and you're like, are they controlling the weather? If so, where's the switch that says, no, thank you, because I don't actually want it to rain. I, if I could lock in the kind of weather that we've had here the last couple of days, if that could be like 300 days out of the year, I'd be pretty cool with that. Actually, it's called San Diego, by the way. That's basically what San Diego is almost every day of the year. So there's a pretty good chance you use an API like that. And, and just ponder for a second how amazing that is to have that in your pocket. I mean, I, I remember when I was younger, you'd kind of turn to the back page of like the first section of the newspaper and it would be the weather report. And that's how you knew what the weather was gonna be like that day. And there really was no way for you at one o'clock in the afternoon to say, hey, I wonder what the temperature is right now. I wonder if it's gonna rain later today. We didn't have that kind of information. It, it's fascinating to me to think about technology that we use today that we just take for granted. If you would go back even just 15 or 20 years would seem just like crazy magic, let alone go back a hundred years. Now, I was talking to somebody about this earlier, but this notion that you can tell rain shall come from the sky in 10 minutes, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, you, you would have either been like worshiped as a king or you would have been burned at the stake, right? There, there wouldn't have been a whole lot in between there. This was not gonna end well having that kind of technology. 
Now, that's probably something that you've used on a regular basis. Now, maybe not one of those, but there's probably something in the Google ecosystem that you've interacted with one way, shape, or form, whether you knew it or not. And it's important to ask, I think, why did we have this Cambrian explosion of APIs? Why is that going on? And a huge part of it is just a reaction to natural technology changes. So think about what phones used to be. They were phones. Think about what your phone is today. It's a computer that has an app to make phone calls that you probably hardly ever use. You probably text a lot more than you use the phone feature. I've tried deleting the phone app, it turns out you can't. It's too bad, it'd be kind of nice actually. I'm always amazed when someone actually calls me, I'm like, why are you calling me? This is so bizarre, so strange. I didn't appreciate how big a change this was. I mean, I just sort of take it for granted now that we're all walking around with these supercomputers in our pockets. But I was up at my parents over the holidays this winter and I was doing something on my phone and my mom looked at me and she said, is that one of these kind of phones or one of these kind of phones? Because that's how she conceptualizes this stuff. And it's even weirder for my son, he's 11, so he's never known a world without the iPhone. To my son, a piece of glass is a phone. He's never known a phone any different than that. And so we have this old phone in our kitchen, what's well, meant to look like an old phone. And he was looking at it one day and he's like, Dad, why are the buttons in a circle? Because that was just like such a weird concept to him. Because it's like, well, you just, you just tap the glass. Why? I don't understand. So we've got these computers that we're bringing with us everywhere that we expect to do interesting things. You know, we need to be able to watch cat videos 24 hours, seven days a week, no matter where we are. And of course, they're talking to this commoditized hardware that we euphemistically refer to as the cloud. Now, companies started altering their approach during this era as well. And there was a little startup, a little scrappy company called Amazon that started making a pretty major change. And we didn't know about it right away. In fact, we didn't find out about it until they were well down this path. But then somebody wrote a little rant on Google Plus, by the way, still a thing, until they finally got rid of it after they discovered a whole bunch of records got leaked, oops. So Steve Yegi, who worked at Google, used to work at Amazon, he works somewhere else now. He wrote this piece meant for internal consumption. It was basically what Google does well, what Amazon does well, and it was meant to kind of be an educational piece for, for his Google peers. And so Yegi laid out the Bezos mandate. So at some point in the aughts, Bezos made a mandate to his development staff to said, all right, here's how things are gonna be from now on. All data will be exposed through a public service interface, public API. That will be the communication method between teams, period, full stop. There will be no other forms of communication between teams. There will be no direct reads. There'll be no direct links. There'll be no back doors. These APIs are the communication method. Oh, and by the way, they all need to be designed to be publicly available. That does not mean they all will be, but if we decide tomorrow that should be something that the public can get at, it needs to be ready to do that at the flip of a switch. And of course, he signed off this mandate by literally saying, if you don't agree with this, you're fired. Kind of helps to be the founder, majority shareholder, now like the richest person in the world by seemingly an order of magnitude. It's, it's kind of stunning how much money he's worth right now. Now, as you can imagine, developers reacted to this incentive and said, okay, we're going to start changing. We'll start writing these APIs. We'll start essentially building what we now call microservice architectures. And we started to learn a few things. Turns out when a call bounces between 20 different services, it's a little harder to figure out where the problem happened. Who made the mistake? And then lots of finger pointing happens. Well, it couldn't have been my code. It's got to be your code. You write crappy code. Middle of the night when there's a problem, who do you wake up? Who do you page? Always fun. How do you monitor all this? How do you figure out what's going on? What services are up? What services are down? How much capacity do we have? Is this, is this service saturated yet? How do you even find all these services? By the way, this is at least part of the reason why most organizations that truly have lots and lots of microservices don't really know how many they have because people just keep inventing them and they often reinvent the wheel. Imagine that. No one could have predicted this. Turns out it's a lot harder to debug these environments because I can't just load it up in my ID and step through it because I'm bouncing between. I may not even have access to your code. I may not even be able to see what you're doing. I just black box to me. I make a call, something happens. Now, none of this has changed today because of course I can't swing a dry erase marker in an organization without hearing somebody talk about microservices. Somebody want to talk about where their bounded contexts are. People are dusting off their copies of domain-driven design and finally reading it. So I guess that's a win. 
Now, one of the things that I've had to engage in over the last few years is what would you say a microservice is? And this leads to one of my favorite tweets. My, my boss actually tweeted this out a while ago. I love it. Who wants to argue about the definitions of made up words with me? It's a lot of what we do in this industry. That's not what a microservice is. Haha, -ha, this is what a microservice is. I disagree with your approach. You're wrong. Now, I've had some people tell me a microservice is literally anything I can rewrite in two weeks or less. I kind of like that one because it reminds us it needs to be small. And people are like, well, I don't know if we should use closure for this. Well, worst case scenario, we rewrite it. That takes an iteration. We should be fine. Right, so that to me is a good metric. I've had a lot of people use the two pizza team metric with me. This one's always made me a little uncomfortable for a couple reasons. First of all, how big are the pizzas? And maybe more importantly, how hungry is the team? Because let's be honest, there's times where, you know, that might be a single serving pizza if you're really hungry. But if we just had lunch, well, we're probably not gonna touch that pizza hardly at all. But my real problem with the two pizza team metric, it does not answer a more important question, which is how many services can your two pizza team handle? This is actually a question that, that my director sent to me when I was at my previous organization as we were starting to go down this path. He said, Nate, I need to know how to structure my teams now. How many microservices can these two pizza teams handle? I, of course, did what we always do, which is, I don't know. It depends. It depends on how busy those services are. Are they constantly evolving? Are they changing rapidly? Well, my two pizza team might only be able to handle three, four, five of those. If they're pretty stable, they're not changing a lot, well, maybe that same exact team can handle 15 or 20 of those. Now, of course, we keep changing definitions. I've had some people say we're beyond microservices now. We do mini services. The really snarky ones will say we do Pico services. And of course, it challenges the whole definition of application. Application used to be a fairly benign term before. And now it's like, what do we mean by that? Now, I saw this very directly in my previous company. We went through and evaluated our portfolio for cloud readiness. And at the senior level management, they viewed an application as a very coarse grained thing. And there were like 400 applications in the portfolio or something like that. When we start working with the individual teams, they're like, oh no, the Wombat application isn't a singular thing. It's made up of these 14 modules that are all independently deployable. Which of course was starting to be refactored into dozens and dozens of microservices that were all independently deployable. And so now what at the senior level management is a singular thing called Wombat, turns out it's a hundred things down at the developer level. So what do we mean by application? The senior level management did not want one to become a hundred because heads would explode because now instead of having 400 applications in the, in the portfolio, we'd have 20,000 or some crazy thing and that wasn't going to fly. So we actually started using the word deployable unit as kind of the lowest level of abstraction, so to speak. And of course, now we're already starting to see this morph into functions. Everything's got to be a function. I actually had somebody say to me earlier this year, I'm going to refactor my entire application as a series of functions. I thought, good luck. There are probably a small handful of applications in the entire world that truly are nothing but a series of functions. I do not think that is the norm. So we're starting to see a lot of interest in functions and all the different you know, function platforms. We keep looking for golden hammers, although I suppose in our industry, it's probably more appropriate to say we're looking for something like this. Of course, you have to be worthy to lift that. And of course, I, I guess if you're following up with Canon, it has been destroyed. So I guess I'm not sure what happens now. We need to find a new symbol. So sorry, that doesn't exist. Although I admit it would be very helpful in your next retrospective. The moral of the story is we still have actual engineering issues that we have to deal with on our projects day in, day out. It is not in fact all puppies and rainbows. I am sorry for that. All those things that Yegi mentioned that Amazon discovered oh so many years ago are in fact still things today. So for many of us, we realize as we start refactoring to microservices, wow, the call pattern here gets kind of crazy. We don't, it's, it's hard to reason about our systems. In fact, in some cases, it's impossible to reason about our systems because they start to look like this. This is known as the Death Star architecture. I'm not entirely sure how to feel about the fact that they do in fact look like the Death Star. I don't know if that's a coincidence or what. Maybe, in fact, that's what the Death Star was, just a collection of microservices. That's why they kept blowing up. I don't know. It turns out that traditional sysadmin approach doesn't work in this environment. 
because the traditional sysadmin approach has a baked in inherent tension. We have conflicting incentives. As a developer in this environment, I want to release early, release often. I want to always be changing stuff. But that doesn't work with my sysadmins because they're like, whoa, no, no, I'm rated on availability. I'm rated on uptime. If you guys always be changing stuff, my numbers go down, that hurts my review. I'm not letting you hurt my review. Which is where we get to this notion of it works, nobody breathe on it. This results in trench warfare because we are diametrically opposed. I wanna change all the time, they don't wanna change anything ever. We gotta to try to find a way to change the scope of that conversation. It turns out we actually don't have to have these fights. We can all get along, but we have to take a different approach to operations. So the idea of SRE at its core is what happens when you take engineering concepts, if you take software engineers and basically say, go design an operations team. So what happens when we take the same kind of things we've been doing on the software side of the world and apply those concepts to the operations side of the world? So a huge part of this is how do we replace as much manual stuff with automation as possible? Now this should be a good outcome simply from the fact that automation does the same thing every single time. Human beings do not. A script will never skip steps. A script never gets bored. A script never fat fingers something. So we need to focus on engineering. And in fact, interestingly enough, a lot of people that get into the SRE space are themselves software engineers by trade. It is useful though not required to understand Unix internals and to have a good foundation in networking. But the moral of the story is our operational approach has got to evolve in this environment. I worked in an organization years ago where we had, I can't remember exactly what the name it was, but it was this, this review board that you had to go in front of for every production release. And I remember thinking it was a complete waste of time because I'd spend many, many days filling out all their paperwork and then getting on their schedule and going in front of them. And of course, they had no knowledge of my application because they were so high up in the org. This is all just, you know, it's like, like the teacher in Charlie Brown. You're just wah, 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 wah. You know, so they always just rubber stamped everything because what did, how were they supposed to have enough knowledge to say, whoa, whoa, I think that change you're doing is kind of risky. How would they know? Now the moral of the story is today, we need to move fast, but we need to move fast safely. You know, the analogy I like to use is if somebody pulled out in front of the hotel with a car and they're like, dude, hop in, this car goes really, really fast. And you get in, you're like, but where are the seatbelts? And they're like, oh, don't worry about the seatbelts, the car goes really fast. You'd, you'd probably get out of the car. I mean, at least I think I would. You know, every so often you hear about some idiot with more money than sense takes like a Ferrari and like flips it over at 120 miles an hour. It's like, well, Darwin. The moral of the story is our operations group has got to be able to support these dynamic environments that we need today. And that's, in my opinion, what's at the core of SRE. Because we need to create these environments that give us stable, reliable places for our services to work. But none of that happens in spare cycles. And so it's important that our SREs have enough slack in their schedule that they can actually do engineering work. If they're constantly on call, constantly dealing with tickets, constantly doing manual work, they can never do any of that engineering work to get rid of that toil. And that needs to be an important consideration here. We want to remove as much toil as possible. Now, it is fair to look at that and say, this sounds an awful lot like DevOps. And I would say it's a natural extension of that. You can think of it maybe as an implementation of DevOps or an evolution of DevOps. But I, I would also argue it is a reaction to these environments that we have today with hundreds, thousands of services and functions and all sorts of things that are, again, very, very difficult to reason about. So what do my SREs do? What, what does an SRE team focus on? It's a lot of the illities that you can guess, like availability and stability and monitoring. They help with capacity planning. This is still a thing even in the cloud. I've had some people say, oh, I don't need to worry about capacity because it scales to infinity. Well, sort of, but there's a big asterisk, which is additional fees may apply. And if you continue to scale to infinity, your CFO will come have a conversation with you. I assure you of that fact. Obviously, there's going to be emergency response. This is one of the things that fascinates me. I've seen a lot of organizations where very heavyweight bureaucratic high ceremony process to de deploy code in an effort to prevent bad things from happening, which I understand, but then they never spend any time trying to figure out what should happen when that bad thing happens, because despite all our best efforts, bad things will happen. Nature of the beast. 
You know, I, I spend a fair amount of time on airplanes and I just know at some point in the year, I will miss a flight. There will be a delay, there'll be an equipment issue. It's gonna happen, it's just the nature of the beast. I, in fact, in August, I actually had to spend the night in my own home airport, if you can believe that, because they kept delaying, 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 and then finally canceled the flight at like two in the morning, which was so awesome. I was very happy with Delta that day. But I just accept that because I know there are things that are beyond our control. It's just the nature of the beast. And quite frankly, almost all the time, it works out fairly well, heavily knock on wood since I'm getting an airplane tomorrow. The moral of the story is we need to drive automation. We can use our SREs to help us understand our service level objectives, what makes sense for this application. The other real important part of this is it's about embracing risk. It's about managing risk. There is no such thing as elimination of risk, period. There is always risk. Every one of us took a calculated risk coming to this, this center this morning. Simply getting in a car or a cab involves a certain amount of risk. And yet we don't give it a second thought because the vast majority of the time it's all fine. So this is a continuum. How much risk are we willing to accept? What risk are we absolutely not willing to accept? And honestly, a lot of that's a business decision. What makes sense for the business? What are our customers expect of us? If you're a retailer today and you have an online, well, if you're a retailer today and you don't have an online presence, that's scary. But if you have an online presence and your IT department says, oh, it's available five by 12, that, that's not gonna work. Because 24 hours a day, seven days a week, somebody can go to a competitor that is available 24 by seven, seven days a week. So we have to think about what our competitors can provide. We have to think about cost. There's no getting around that. Cost is an important consideration. I'm sure you all remember last, I think it was last year, when Amazon S3 went down and literally like a third of the internet went down with it, exposing, hey, I guess a lot of our apps have a dependency on S3. Didn't know that. And when this happened, there was a lot of chatter, a lot of conversation about how come those applications went down. In a cloud environment, shouldn't you have had redundancy? Shouldn't you have been able to instantly spring up in another availability zone? And of course, the answer to this is a little more complicated. And I used this quote yesterday. I apologize for those of you that saw me yesterday. There's three answers to every question in computer science. 42, that's to see who's read Hitchhiker's Guide. Another layer of indirection. That's what I reach for as an architect. But of course, the answer I use the most in my current job is, well, it depends. Now, a lot of people get mad at me when I say it depends because they think it's a glib answer. They think I'm trying to shut down the conversation. I'm not. This is the beginning of the conversation. So in this particular case where my application went down because S3 went down, the important question to ask is how much did that cost you? There's a business cost to being down for four hours. Now, I've worked on systems where every hour we were down was a seven digit number. Those are the kind of systems that when they're down, it gets everyone's attention. And, and admittedly, when those systems have problems, it's not a lot of fun when the senior vice president is standing over your shoulder. Is it up yet? Are we, are we back online? Are we back online yet? Because you know this is costing us a lot of money, right? Yes, I'm aware. Please back away. So the real question is, how much revenue did they lose versus how much would it have cost to have all this duplication in place? Because the duplication is not free. There's engineering effort, there's cost to having those other environments available. And so this is more of a business decision, honestly, than a technical decision. If being down for four hours meant you lost a thousand bucks and it would have cost you a hundred thousand to have that redundancy baked in, you made the right choice. Now, obviously, if those numbers were reversed, you are probably looking for a new job. But that's why it's more complicated than just saying, well, of course we should have had redundant backup across multiple availability zones because that's what Netflix does. Well, Netflix has a little different business model than you have. And people get very grumpy when they can't press a button and live stream high def television to any device anywhere in the world. There's another one of those things that if, if I if you go back to when I was in college, the idea that you could stream high, I mean, high def didn't even exist yet, which isn't it amazing when you see a non high def stream now? It just, it looks like, like who put Vaseline on the screen? It's so fuzzy, it's so weird, it's not, it's not crisp. It's just amazing how quickly we adapt. Like so many things, guys, it's a trade-off. Now the other part of this is we have to think about long-term versus short-term. Now a lot of people get into these heroic efforts and you know, they sort of hoist the company on their shoulder, we run towards that hill. 
but we all know that's not sustainable. I worked with a guy a bunch of years ago who'd kind of done that. He'd sort of taken the company on. We we're, were doing this big UI change and he was kind of driving it. And over the course of the summer, he, he lost a lot of weight and he got big bags under his eyes. He got so bad, our manager finally came up to him and said, you're taking two weeks off in August. I don't care where you go. You're not bringing your laptop. You're not bringing your phone. You need to go away for a couple of weeks. But that's what he had to do to, to finally get him to start taking care of himself. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of situations where we're better off lowering our SLO for a little while so that we can engineer a better long-term answer and get a better overall SLO when we're done. We wanna think about mean time to recovery and this is where having a run book is immensely useful. So Google will tell you this gives you a three times improvement on your mean time to recovery as opposed to just letting people wing it and figure it out. Now, the best way I can describe that is this fantastic quote that says, you know, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. There's no getting around that. This is why special operators train at the tempo they train at, because they know things are going to go wrong when they're actually on a real world mission. So this is something we need to consider that when these emergencies happen, you're not thinking broadly. You're not like, oh, look, these flowers are so lovely. You're focused on what's right in front of you and you often miss things. This is why most doors in buildings are designed to push out because if there's a fire, everyone's reaction is to push. And so when they run into a door that pulls, what do people do? They push harder. Even though we all realize, oh, it's probably a pull. Let me just pull it. You're like, oh, no, no, just keep pushing harder. Try harder. I saw this tweet and it kind of scared me actually. I don't really understand escape rooms, but escape room concept, you're a software engineer, there's a prod ops issue. No one knows how it works, but there's various git diffs spread around the office. You've got an hour, go. That, that sounds terrifying. You know, where, where's the emergency button that gets me out of this room? I actually showed this to one person. He said, dude, that's my life. I went, oh, I'm so sorry. So we want our SREs to think about our monitoring solutions. We want them to help us establish alerting, establish good logging best practices. Logging is one of those fascinating things. We tend to do one of two things with logging. We either log everything in triplicate or we don't log anything at all. There's like no in between. I was working on, on a demo yesterday and I couldn't get it to work and I kept getting this error that was, it just listed out the alphabet and numbers and said unacceptable runes and I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what you're telling me. Like, give me more, you know? And I did the verbose, I did everything, and it was just like info, 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 info. I don't like this, but I'm not gonna tell you why. Great. Create dashboards, they look something like this, potentially. There's a lot of good products out there on this. The challenge with, with the metrics and the dashboards these days is because our tools give us so much stuff, it's very easy to monitor some of these and then realize, oh wait, this isn't actually meaningful for me. You know, because, but I can do it because it's right there and I can tweak all this and I can change the sampling frequency and there's all these different things I can do. And it's like, what is meaningful for me? This is where SREs can help because as a software engineer, I might not get enough exposure to this where my SREs have seen a whole bunch of different versions of this and they can understand if we change this sampling frequency, we actually get better data. You know, some people are using like, you know, the Envoy dashboards. I mean, the moral of the story is we need to think about these four golden signals. What's our latency? How long does it take for us to respond to something? What's our traffic level? How many errors are we getting? Now, errors could be a failed request, they could be a policy failure, they could be an implicit failure. These resources we have, how saturated are they? And one of the hardest parts about doing this is sampling frequency. By nature, we're like, well, give me more. I need to realize, oh wait, the human ear can't actually distinguish between that. So in a lot of cases, we're actually better off doing more aggregate data, doing a, a longer sampling frequency. And so that takes some time to figure that out. Alerting thresholds are hard too. This can be tough to find Goldilocks because we want alerts that are actionable. Alerts should require a human being. If the system can fix itself, don't alert on that. You may have something that shows up later on a report to say this app instance crashed and it was, you know, we brought a new app instance up eight seconds later there should be a sense of urgency that goes along with it. Think about the last time you heard a car alarm. Was your natural reaction, I should call the police. There's a car being stolen. Or was it, please shut that freaking noise off already. I see the same thing with fire alarms. I used to work in a building where the fire alarm would go off, 
a couple of times a month. And so you just tuned it out and you're basically like, has the fire department showed up yet? No, okay, it's not a real fire. It's like that scene, I don't know how many of you watched Friends back in the day, I'm kind of dating myself here. There was a scene where, where Joey and Chandler were both in there, these like lazy boys that they got, that was like the whole episode was them being in lazy boys. And at the very end, like the fire alarm's going off and they're sitting there, well, should we get out of the chairs? One of them reaches over, floor's not hot, we got time. <laughs> I can't have more than a few pages a day. If I do, I'm gonna burn people out, that's not good for them. It's very easy and very common to both over alert and over monitor. We need to work on eliminating toil, so we've got to automate everything humanly possible. Anything that's manual, anything that's repetitive, anything that's automatable, we need to get rid of that. We need to watch out for the reactive grunt work type things. That tends to be what drives people out of SRE. It hurts morale, and frankly, it sets a bad precedent that, oh, I can get you to do this. Again, people are incapable of doing the same thing twice. If you don't believe me, try taking up golf as a hobby. You'll find out very quickly that that is not a particularly easy sport when it comes to repeatability something my 11 year old does not understand. I need consistency in software. It's okay in your hobby. It's not okay when it comes to me producing good software that gets the job done. I need a deployment pipeline that is repeatable, that our code has gone through time and time again. And the moral of the story is I can't move quickly. I can't adapt to these business changes unless my SREs are working on making sure those environments are stable. If they're dealing with toil, we can't move forward as rapidly as we want. One of the most important parts of this is post-mortems. I assure you there will be problems, there will be outages, we will make mistakes, we'll screw something up. That is the nature of the beast. There is perfectly fine to make mistakes. As I tell my son on a regular basis, the important thing is to learn from them. Making the same mistake again and again is the real crime. Making a mistake in the first place is the only way we learn. The challenge with postmortems is they tend to devolve into blame storming. Oh, this was your fault. No, it was your fault. Hey, can we blame that group? Yes, we can. Awesome. So you want to get into a blameless postmortem concept. And ultimately, we just want to make sure it doesn't happen again. So what happened? What was the root cause? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again in the future? This needs to be constructive, not sarcastic. You may want to use a basic template. Give it a title. You might want to have an incrementing ID. Who wrote it? What's the status? Is this fixed? Is this in progress? What was the impact? What was the root cause? And this is almost always plural. There's almost always never one thing. There's these eight things happened to line up in the right time sequence to cause a problem. How do we resolve it? What kind of action items do we have coming out of that? And probably the most important part, what do we learn? Now, the other part that makes this really critical is what was the timeline here? Because it's fascinating to me to see how many of these things if they would have happened in a different order would not have been a problem. I mean, think about a car accident you got into at some point in your life. If you would have left wherever you left five seconds earlier, five seconds later, you probably don't get into that accident. But of course, we never think about the thousands of accidents we're not involved in because we left at the right time. So anything that you think helps, perfectly normal here. There's lots of templates out on the interwebs. This happens to be sort of an example postmortem from the Google folks. You know, you can add whatever you want. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's hard to get this postmortem culture. You may wanna do like a postmortem of the month to encourage people to talk about it. I've seen some organizations that put, put these things up in the bathrooms so people are kind of used to seeing them on a regular basis. You might do a book club to talk about it. Some organizations do the Wheel of Misfortune, which basically gives people a chance to role play a disaster that you've already worked through. So instead of throwing them right into the fire, you do a practice run or 10 to kind of ease them into this stuff. You want to pat people on the back when they do good work. You want to make sure senior management understands the value of this. And of course, you want to retro your postmortems. How can we do it better? How can we improve? Now, the, the, the phrase I keep going back to in these situations is this quote from this very fascinating book. We cannot learn anything without first not knowing something. There was a point in your life where you did not know how to tie your shoes. You know how to tie shoes now to the point where if I asked you, how do you do it? You'd be like, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I do that. You know, you don't, you don't even know what you're doing. You're just, your hands just do it. You know, and so the moral of the story is, this is how we learn. Now, the other part of this that's interesting is understanding that some services are more equal than others. And so we need to understand our SLOs. And in many cases, we're talking about availability. And so we say, what would the availability goal of this particular service be? Now, if you talk to most customers, they want everything. Actually, if you ask them, they don't want five nines, they want a hundred. 
I want no downtime ever, which of course is impossible. Everybody wants hot, hot right up until the point where they see how much that costs. This is the very definition of if you have to ask, you can't afford it. A far better approach here is to establish an error budget. So we come up with a target. Let's say it's two nines. That means our error budget is 1%. As a development team, I can spend that error budget however I want. I just can't exceed it. We are not going for zero outages. That is not the goal. The goal is to stay within our error budget. So experiment. Try different things. Do A-B testing. Once you're done, once you've used up that budget, you might not be able to do a release for a few days. What this fundamentally does is align our incentives with our production support people. So now we all understand the trade-offs. It's not me versus you. It's not you telling me I can't change. It's, we'll change, but understand the cost of that. Now, how do we work with SREs? A lot of this boils down to things like production readiness reviews. These are not a big upfront high ceremony thing. We want to review our services on a regular basis. I will say this again. This does not have to be a high ceremony, multi-hour process. Get your groups together, your SREs, your architects, your devs, whoever is the subject matter experts, draw the architecture up on the board. Do we all understand it? I assure you, you don't. I've seen this time and time again. Well, you know, this talks to this system. No, it doesn't. What do you mean? Well, no, this system talks to this system, which talks to that system. Oh, when that happened? Three years ago. And these are people who work on the system day in, day out. Everybody understand the requirements? Probably not. Start walking through it. You will inevitably find bottlenecks like, oh, you know what? It turns out this system only gives us two nines. So I thought it gave us three nines. Nope. You're going to find interesting failure cases like, oh, well, if month end happens to correspond with a super blue blood moon, it turns out our systems all just go haywire. That'll be going to give you some diagrams or two. You're going to get some new items for your backlog. And what we're striving for is trust. We need to trust these services that when we put them into production, they're going to do what we say they're going to do, that they behave, that they perform their jobs reliably. That's a big deal, especially in these environments where, again, you've got dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of services, and they interact in weird and interesting ways. So we need to trust those services. How do we know? Well, think about having a checklist. And I know you might think that's kind of low tech. If you don't think checklists are interesting, I beg you to read this book. And just keep in mind, there are some really interesting fields that use checklists, like pilots and surgeons. I spend a lot of time on airplanes. Airplanes are remarkably safe. Why? Because before you take off, your pilots are walking through a series of checklists, every item of which is hard earned. We want things that are quantifiable and measurable. I'm tired of someone telling me my service needs to be fast. What's fast? We want our services to be stable. We want them to be reliable, scalable, fault tolerant, performant. Do we have monitoring in place? Do we have documentation? And I understand that your first reaction might be, I don't have time for all this. We need to move fast and break things. I usually hear this, especially from teams that say, we are big A agile. Well, my response to that is, what happens to your velocity when you have a major outage? What's that do to your iteration planning? Now, this does involve us having grassroots support as well as sort of the sandwich from on top from our management. So go ahead and perform an audit. Look at that checklist. Does this meet all our requirements? There's a pretty good chance you're going to get some new items for your backlog that you can then go ahead and prioritize along with everything else you have to do. So you can start thinking about when would we do that? How does that fit in with the rest of our workload? Now, I understand that this is manual, but a lot of it can be automated. I would love it if you would add this book to your reading queue if you're interested in this topic. This is Evolutionary Architecture from Neil, Rebecca, and Patrick. One of the most important ideas to come out of this is fitness functions which is, in a nutshell, a series of tests that we execute to validate our architecture does what we think it does. So evolutionary architecture comes out of evolutionary computing, which says, hey, when I modify this algorithm, are we getting closer to or further from our goals? Now, hopefully, we can automate the vast majority of this, but some things still have to be manual. Give you some ideas on what some fitness functions might look like. We might decide that all of our service calls must respond within 100 milliseconds. Cyclomatic complexity shall not exceed a small single-digit number. If we have an app failure, a new app instance will spin up to take its place. I can't stress this enough. This is not red tape. This should not be overly bureaucratic. We're talking about a couple of hours. Now, very similar, this is something I do fair often, fairly often, is an architecture review, which basically says, where are the failure points? So you draw up that architecture, and you start asking impertinent questions like, what happens if this fails? 
I assure you in my experience, someone will tell you it can't fail. To which I laugh inside, say, well, I know you think that, but humor me, what happens if it does fail? Again, we're great at happy path. We're not so good at unhappy path, but it's vital that we think about that. So think through those failure scenarios. Does our service respond appropriately? And frankly, one of the only ways we know is by practicing chaos engineering. Just think about the way this had to first be described at Netflix. Think about that meeting. All right, guys, I got a great idea. Sometime in the future, I'm not gonna tell you when, I'm gonna go down to the server room, I'm just gonna start yanking out cables. Everybody good? Good plan? Guarantee that was not met with, yeah, great idea, let's implement that immediately. I'm sure there was a lot of, how did this person get in this meeting? Somebody call security, go clean out your desk. But honestly, chaos engineering is our friend in these environments because we cannot reason about some of these systems anymore. We need to throw a little bit of that into the mix. All right, so let me wrap up. Do you have an SRE team? Would you want an SRE team? I assure you these things can be built. You've probably got some folks who would be interested in it. The moral of the story, the types of applications we're building today are very different than what we did in the past. We just keep turning knobs up to 11. And we started obviously with the development side of the house. And I get that. We need to start thinking an awful lot about what that means on the operations side. Because the only way we're gonna succeed is by evolving. And we can't do that if our environments don't enable us to do it. We have to work together. Now, I hope I've whetted your appetite. If you wanna learn more about this, please go read this book. It's available online, it's available on Safari. You do not need to read it cover to cover. It's a series of essays that are roughly grouped together by topic area. So you can read a chapter here, a chapter there. You don't have to read it you know, front to back. You can do read it in whatever order you want, but please add that to your queue if this is interesting to you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I will mill about if you guys have questions, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Cheers.